Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. This is a great and wonderful group of people that's room jammed. The time was when we sure wished we could see a jam room like this, but it would never happen, you know. You know, this uh, trip up here tonight means a great deal to me um, because I spent some time in Minneapolis <coughs> drinking. You know, I... Uh, was um, employed at the Mayo Clinic and um, <clears throat> in a prominent position and proceeded to drink myself right out of it. Uh, and uh, I did a lot of it here in Minneapolis. I think it's marvelous that you're honoring the one-year people rather than us, us old bags that have been around forever and gotten everything. And I do congratulate them as being uh, selected as special people to say thank you to. I couldn't help but think when um, this young lady got up what I did on my first anniversary. Uh, one of the things that I, I feel very strongly about celebrating tonight is my brother's 52nd uh, anniversary. He is dead now, but uh, on my first anniversary, uh, he was sitting right down here in the front uh, looking expectantly at me when I got up to receive my emblem, and uh, I had uh, wanted to make an impression. After all, I'm a professional, and I've got brains and so forth, but I don't know where they'd gone. Uh, <laughs> they had taken a little trip. Uh, so I wrote out a nice speech that I was going to give, and I'm all practiced up, and I'm really going to wow them, you know, all those drunks. I really wasn't a drunk. I was just overtired. <laughs> I had fooled 23 psychiatrists, and they had put me in the hospital for rest because I was tired. It wasn't my drinking and all those pills that I was taking. You know that. And uh, I had written out this lovely talk that I made, and I'm going to read it. And my brother was sitting about where my friend is sitting and I got up and I said my name is Jerry and I looked down at my brother and the tears were streaming down his face and I drew on my breath and I said and I'm awful nervous and I think I'll sit down <laughs> and it was the best talk I ever gave in my life Now, all I want to say now is if you folks get tired of listening before I get tired of talking, raise your hand or leave the room. It doesn't really make that much difference. <laughs> because, you know, you wonder what you're going to say, and you make three talks always. You figure out what you're going to say. Then there's the talk that you really make. And that one on the way home is the most wonderful talk you'll ever make. <laughs> and that's just about the way I feel about it tonight. I, I carry notes because I don't want to start talking about sex to a single girl. And um, because at a nearly 86 and still working, I uh, have sort of, for, you know, I haven't time for that sort of stuff. I was the one that turned my brother in. While I was at the Mayo Clinic, I called a child psychiatrist because that was the area that I was working in. A guy by the name of Jim Plant uh, in Newark, New Jersey, and told him, I said, I've got a moral leper brother who's drinking too much. Now, I was plastered. I'd been started my uh, tour of 23 hospitals because I was overtired. But uh, you see... Uh, I wasn't like he was. He was a moral leper. And uh, Jim said to me, well, Jerry, I, I, I don't know what to do. Now, wait a minute. He said, a couple of months ago, I was in New York, 
at a medical meeting, and there was a guy there that was doing something peculiar with people who drink too much. His name was Bill Wilson. He said, I think he gave me his card. I'll look it up, and I'll call him up. I'll get back to you. He looked it up. He called Bill, and that afternoon, my beloved Bill went out to see my brother in Maplewood, New Jersey, and my brother never drank again. <laughs> One of the great benefits, side benefits of that, was becoming close friends of Bill and Laws. Now remember, I was still drinking, and Bill was so patient with me. I was such an idiot. They called me an overeducated idiot, and I believe I was, they were quite right. And I would say to Bill, uh, Bill, how do you work that thing? And I'd wave my hands. I wouldn't say AA. Uh, <clears throat> how do you work that thing? And he was the most patient soul living. He'd say, Jerry, don't drink. Don't take those pills. I was in Towns Hospital seven times and threw Dr. Silkworth out of my room, and he wouldn't come back when I invited him to come see me. Uh, so Bill knew that I was taking pills. And uh, he said, don't drink. Don't take those pills. Go to meetings. And he hesitated and said, and shut up and listen. <laughs> if he said that to me once, he said it to me 50 times because I was still so bummy that I kept asking him, how do you do that thing? And I fortunately was able to know Bill and Lois very well. It took me six and a half years to find out that I had a problem. Of course, the fact that I was locked up in a psychiatric institution on the west side of Chicago that had uh, iron bars on the windows and an iron bed and a peephole in the door might have had something to do with persuading me a little sooner. Uh, I didn't know how I got there, and I prayed for the first time in I don't know when that my brother, that moral leper brother, would come and get me. And 15 minutes later, the miracle happened. He opened the door to that nut house. And he said, Honey, you've made a pretty lousy mess out of your life. Do you want to do something about it? And I did, but I didn't want to go out with that bunch of holy rollers that were praying all the time, saying the Lord's Prayer, because I didn't believe in God. I want you to know that. If it wasn't God brought him there, I'd like to know what it was. But I was still in the arrogant, drunk state. And he said to me, I'll take you back east. But, and he hesitated and he said, I can't help you. My heart went clear down to my feet. My last hope. I'd lost all my pride in asking him to help me, and he couldn't help me. And it seemed an eternity before he spoke again. He said, but I'll get someone. That was the smartest thing he ever did, and I say to you who have relatives, don't try to help them yourself, because if he had tried to help me, I would have probably been dead now. But he was smart enough to stay back, and every time I would ask him a question, he'd say, I don't know, and I'd say, you're stupid. And he'd say, yeah, I am. Uh, you know, our relatives can do a lot for us by shutting their mouths, and I urge all of you to do that. At that time, they, they were recommending that the spouse not have liquor in the house and not drink. And if you don't mind my saying so, it's a wonderful idea. If you're not an alcoholic, would you tell me why you have to drink alcohol? 
Would you tell me why you have to serve it? Alcohol is not a life necessity for anyone. But uh, I was just lucky. Uh, why am I uh, so lucky? Uh, being an addict? And addiction is pain plus learned relief, my friend. And I certainly got relief, I thought, from alcohol and drugs. But you know something? It wasn't relief. It was a cop-out. And so I had to learn what relief meant. Um, I was in a bad spot because I worked for eight professors of medicine from Northwestern University, and the pills were just beginning to come on the market. And as every new medication came in, they said, we'll try it on Jerry, and if it doesn't kill her, it won't hurt patients. <laughs> They, this was over the counter and they didn't think anything about it and we have to be as alcoholics be careful of the over the counter things they come in and they're all right and six months later they're not all right uh, because this nearly uh, did me in but I was lucky that I was working with those men because it was one of those men that I came to the Mayo Clinic so many years ago and you know what? We were doing a, a special uh, project. And you know what it is? What they call parenting now. But we didn't have a fancy name for it. So uh, it didn't uh, go over that big. But I, uh, the people at the Mayo Clinic have always been very, very good to me. And I'm very grateful for it. Um, I kept hitting the hospitals even after I got up there because I was overworked. Aren't we the greatest liars in the entire world? You know, if they were to have a contest of who's the greatest liar in the country, it would be a drunk or one recovering that would get the prize. You know, uh, the... Time came after I was locked up in that nut house when I went back east and I went to AA forcibly. They say, oh, you can't force people to go to AA. Of course you can afford force people to go to AA. Uh, sometimes it's sentencing, sometimes it's coercion, sometimes it's job, sometimes if we can get people to cooperate, we can go uh, to some of the meetings, whether we want to or not. And I was fortunate because Bill and Lois spent the weekends at my brother's, and I went to the meetings. There wasn't any Al-Anon then, girls, and the wives let me sit with them. The boys didn't want women in that nice little men's organization of theirs, and they made it very plain, and uh, particularly one that stunk like I did, uh, because I was not uh, uh, the nicest thing in the whole world. Um, I did go to meetings, and I did go to the homes of the people, because there was a lot of family business in those days, and going to the houses, and it made me feel wanted not rejected, and that was, I think, a very important thing in my sobriety. Um, I went to meetings consistently, and we had very good meetings. Then we had to go long distances, and it'd be a car full of people going, and we'd have a meeting going, and the meeting we'd listen to, and then we'd have one on the way home. And I w was overwhelmed with AA, and you would have thought something would have gotten through, wouldn't you? Well, after all, I was too bright for you folks. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but I just was too bright. So I packed my things. I was working at the hospital at that time, and I'd put away enough to get a 
ticket back to Chicago to join my friends and drink like a lady. Could I have my water, please? And I wanted to drink like a lady. I never wanted to be anything except a lady, but uh, I managed to be anything but. So I bought a ticket, and I packed my bags and shoved them under the bed. Still the same sneaky person, not drinking and drugging for nine months that I had been. Lying, cheating, stealing. You can call it what you want to, but that's what it is. And I was all set to go. They took me to South Orange to a meeting that night. I can't tell you who spoke or anything about it. But I went home and the AA book that had been given me by Bill was on my bedside table. Now remember, I had thrown it out the window into the snowbank. It was poorly written. Oh, stunk. And uh, it came back on the night table. And I threw it in the garbage. Because after all, such trash that was talking about stopping drinking. It was just trash. And I threw it in the garbage. And it came back on the night table, a little greasy. But it came back. And then I threw it in the dirty laundry that went to the professional laundry. At least it would clean it up. But it came back on the night table. And this night when I was going to run away, I came home and that book was on the night table. And I picked it up. And it fell open to the chapter on how it works. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. And I wasn't following anybody's path except the one to destruction that I was creating. But I went on through, read down through the 12 steps, and I didn't know this until much later. I read those 12 steps in the first person. The way Bill wrote them, because he wouldn't say we, because they told him to put on paper what he thought. I admit that I am powerless over alcohol and that my life is unmanageable. And I went on down through them, closed the book and went to sleep, still intending to run away. I wakened in the morning, sat on the side of the bed, and I suddenly realized that I'd had the first decent night's sleep I'd had in nine months. But I still was going to run. And I sat there a few minutes, and then my spiritual awakening came. The desire to run or to leave AA was lifted from my back, never to return. At no time since then have I ever wanted to get out of AA or run away or do things differently. I wanted to do it the way of the winners and have. And you know something? Every day is the very best day I ever had. And today was a wonderful, wonderful day. Um, there's so many things uh, that I would like to say to you as a group because I find up here truly old-time hard rock AA. And that's what works, my friends. This great and wonderful psychological training is good. If you can't understand, don't drink, dummy. Uh, you know, sometimes you have to have it said in a different way. Uh, the things that were given to me by AA are too numerous to mention. Um, I didn't believe in God when I came. 
And one of the smart old-timers said to me, how about good orderly direction? And my friends, God has given my life good orderly direction. And I didn't worry about it for a long time. And then I began to get um, mixed up um, with religion and spirituality. And I don't know whether any of you know the drunk monk or not runs the monastery down my way. But he and I got to talking about religion. And he said, uh, don't forget that there's a difference between dogma and spirituality. Dogma is the way you set your table for your friends. And God is the best friend you will ever have. And how you set your table for him means not one whit. Now, my uh, father was a hard-shell Baptist. My mother was a Methodist. I married a Roman Catholic, and they forgot to baptize me. Uh, it never seemed quite wor worthwhile. But I, uh, today, I'm grateful to go to any house of God, regardless of what they call it or what they name it. And how they set their table is their business. Because I don't tell you when I go to your house to dinner how to set your table, what to feed you. But the thing I was having trouble with was spirituality. And spirituality in the simplest form that I've found is a set of standards that you try to live by every day. That you think the God of your understanding would accept if you were called tonight. And the drunk monk said, Do you have such a standard, Jerry? And I said, Yep. He said, Have you got it written down? I said, I don't have to. It's on the wall because in my office there's a big plaque for the 12 steps. And his remark to me I wish to pass on to you. Be sure you go up and down them every day. Don't forget that they are to be used, not abused, but used in your life and not for anyone else. Along the way, I uh, heard that they uh, kissed a lot, you know, to keep it simple, stupid. And I found an Irishman that I <clears throat> practiced on. And uh, <laughs> here I am with all this mess of religion, and I married an Irish bachelor, 50 years old, that came complete with aged mother as a package. <laughs> but he was just coming into AA about the time I was, and we went to meetings, and we did marry. And I loved him the day I met him. I loved him the day I married him. When love is understanding whether I approved or not. And I loved him the day he died. Because along the way, Tom helped hundreds of people. He saw to it that there was a clubhouse built. He was a very hard worker. He would take anybody any place at any time of the day or night. And he, I say, he helped hundreds of people. But he never knew anything about medication. And I think we have to be very careful about the medications today that are coming across the counter. The painkillers, the mood changers, the new ones, the old ones, the uppers, the downers, the in-betweeners. Look out for the swinging doors because we return to the drug of choice, which for me was alcohol, although I took a lot of pills. Tom knew nothing about this. But he had a bad back. And a 
friend gave him some muscle relaxants. And gee, it helped. He liked that. But the man said, don't tell Jerry she's a nut on those things. And he didn't. And a couple of weeks later, he had a cigarette cough. And I was the first person in the United States to stop smoking in a treatment center. <laughs> you know. But Tom had a cigarette cough, and the guy gave him some non-alcoholic cough medicine with the same thing, don't tell Jerry. She's a nut on those things, and it had several mood and mind-changing drugs in it. Now, this man had been sober 20 years in helping people. And two days after he took that cough medicine, he was in the bar. And he was in 14 hospitals in 17 months, and he bled to death of esophageal varices. I tell this because perhaps his death may save someone else's life because he truly didn't know. But he died just the same. This disease is very patient. It will wait for you forever. I have only had to have drugs once since I got sober. And I had been sober five years working in the hospital where I had the surgery. And I told the anesthesiologist, uh, uh, I react very poorly to anesthesia. You have to give me a lot. He said, oh, Jerry, mind your own business. I'm the anesthesiologist. Don't you know that I know more than you do? And I said, well, don't say I didn't tell you. And uh, so they gave me an anesthetic, and it didn't work. And they gave me a second one, and it was iffy. And the third one finally knocked me out, but they didn't give me enough, and I came out with the anesthesia on the table while they were still stitching. And my language sober is not exactly uh, the best in the world, <clears throat> and I never asked anybody what I said, but I was next to the operating room, and every doctor in the hospital looked in my room, took a look at my face, and began to laugh. Now, I'm not dumb, so I didn't ask what I did, but I've got a pretty good idea that I uh, talked uh, just a little out of turn, you know, but I have never found it necessary to take anything since. Um, in those days, we were talking about kissing a lot. Keep it simple, stupid. And you know... Um, when we did and stuck together, things went along well. I say to you tonight, whether you're sober one year or 50, we're all sober tonight. And you're as sober as I am, and I'm as sober as you are. And you know, I don't ever have to be drunk again. I don't ever have to be out of control if I will listen to Bill's simple language, don't drink, don't take those pills, and shut up and listen. These are the things that we have to think about. And, um, you know, some people worry about the old-timers being smarter. They aren't any smarter than you are. They just have more days sober but they can be less smart than you are. And I hope that you keep it simple, just one day at a time. You don't have to be an intellectual giant. You don't have to know all the things about alcohol. It doesn't help a bit. Remember, the overeducated idiot almost killed herself. Um, so I say to you, that you can be sober if you keep it simple. Don't get off the track. 
and go to meetings. Suppose there hadn't been anybody there when you went. You have a personal obligation to go to meetings. And if you drank every day, you go to meetings every day. And any good drunk drank as long as there was alcohol someplace. I ran alcohol across the Canadian border, not far from here, strapped between my legs in hot water bottles. <laughs> when, when I didn't even drink, I wanted to be popular. And with two quarts of Canadian booze, honey, I was popular. My first drink was hard cider, some straight alcohol from the doctor's office, and a handful of phenobarbital, and I flew right over the moon. And, <laughs> and from then on, I was, I was really uh, very happy about being a drunk. I didn't know I was. A friend of mine who writes books, I don't know how many of you read anything that Agmandino writes. I always thought he was an alcoholic. And if you've read one of his later books, A Better Way to Live, you know that he is. And if you get tired of the steps, alternate it daily with this. And in these, I'd like to read you just a few of them. What time am I supposed to stop? Huh? <laughs> he says, I stop when I'm finished. Good night, folks. <laughs> nice having known you. But Ag says, count your blessings. And don't forget to say thank you to your God. Not bitch, bitch, bitch. You know, we go to bed I had a rough time today and I feel so bad and I didn't get a lot of that. Can't you just say thank you and go to sleep? <laughs> Don't make any difference what you thank you for. And the second thing he suggests is every day deliver more than you're getting paid to do. I think many alcoholics do. And then they begin to pat themselves on the back and say, well, it's time for me to retire. Well, then it's time for you to be buried. Uh, if you're not going to get paid for your work, you can do volunteer work. And it's a good thing you're not down my way or I'd have you working. Uh, down on the floor, scrubbing the floor with a toothbrush, probably. <laughs> Number three, if you make a mistake and get knocked down, don't look back at it too long. This is life's way of teaching you. Your capacity for blunders is inseparable with your capacity to reach your goals. And four, reward your long hours of work in the very best way around your family. And don't forget that family is so important. AA was a family group to begin with Let's get back to it. Let's not separate the family. To you non-alcoholics, go to open meetings of AA. Learn about the program, whether your problem is drinking or not. Your problem is drinking because if it's your spouse, your problem's drinking, his or hers, whichever the case may be. Build this day on a foundation of pleasant thoughts. Let your actions speak for you, but be on guard against the terrible trap of false pride and conceit. This can halt your progress completely. Each day is a special gift, and while life may not always be fair, never allow pains, hurdles, and handicaps of the moment to poison your attitude. This is just some of the things that I'd like to tempt you to get this book, particularly the people who've been in AA for a long time. They say, I get tired of reading the same thing. And you tend to memorize it, and you don't really look at it. So when the same thing is said in a little different way, uh, 
perhaps you might just absorb a little more of. Because what we want to do is go up. The fancy ones call it maturing. Well, I say I'm about as mature as I'm going to get. Uh, my uh, next birthday, I'll be 86, and I'm still working seven days a week, and I like it that way. Um, but maturity is a little bit like humility. It's something you can't see in yourself. So get, keep yourself a sponsor. I don't care whether you're a, quote, old-timer or a new-timer or a middle-timer or a today-timer. Have somebody that you can talk to. We suggest that you have six-day numbers and six-night numbers because they might not be home, and if you dial 12 numbers and you don't get an answer, you're going to jerk the phone right out of the wall and probably go out to a meeting. It's what you should do. <laughs> Maturity helps us lose our self-centeredness, and this we must do. It's so much fun to help other people. If you say you're mature, do you mean what you say? And do you say what you mean? We are often confused and disorganized, and we need to harness our thoughts. And where do we do it? At the meetings. Keeping it simple, shutting up and listening. My first few AA meetings were in South Orange, New Jersey, and there was a little sawed-off sergeant from Fort Marmoth, little hunk, and I kept putting my hand up to talk, and he'd say, shut up, shut up, that's what Bella told me. I said, I thought you could do A and N way you wanted to, and he looked down his nose at me, and he said, you don't have a way. And you know, we don't when we try to do it ourselves. But it looks like there's a lot of people in this room that haven't tried to do it their way. And for this, I am extremely grateful. I am grateful to come up here and see this room full of people. Oscar came into AA 52 years ago. And I followed shortly. But I wasn't a good pupil like he was. At least I didn't think I was. And sometimes we begin to feel inadequate. And that's God's way of trying to tell us, get to meetings, dummy. Call up somebody, dummy. And he often tells me that sort of thing. I meant to tell you that if you got tired of listening before I got tired of talking to hold up your hand or leave the room, and I think maybe I'd better just hold up my own hand and uh, tell you that I love coming up here. I appreciate the halfway house that takes so many of my boys, and I love you all, boys, each and every one of you. And I love the whole room full of people. You are my family. You are my loved ones. You love me. Not because of what I do, but in spite of it. It's understanding, remember, whether you approve or not. And so I try to keep it simple and say thank you at night. And each night I ask God to take my hand. It's better that way I know. Because if I take his, instead of his taking mine, I might get afraid and let go. God bless you and keep you safe. And may you have the joy every day that I have. And may this room continue to expand. And I thank you for inviting me. God bless you.
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.